Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Talent Gap Fireside Chat, where we talk about causes of and solutions to the talent gap. I'm your host, Pete Strauss, and joining me today is Matthew Webster. Matthew is the founder of Cyvergence. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here. Could you give our audience a little background on yourself and your career thus far? Sure. So um, I've been in the industry more than 25 years. Um, I have been a chief information security officer three times, and one of those positions was a global chief information security officer. Um, I've also been in the sales world for a little bit and uh, came in with under 10 years of IT experience before jumping into the security space. So I've worked with very large companies and very small companies and everything in between. So I come up with a broad perspective on things, but uh, happy to be here today and help out any way I can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that you've kind of been with smaller companies as well as larger companies. How have you noticed, I guess, the differences in hiring between the smaller companies and the larger companies? Like I would, I would guess a few things, but I'm curious to get your thoughts on how, how it actually was. So what, what I found is it, it all depends on the organization. So one of the organizations I was at uh, from a small, from a small company perspective, it was really tight. We had very strong needs. We we're building from the ground up uh, the entire security program. In that particular case, we had to move very quickly. So we needed stronger staff. We can't start out with just a beginner because if we take the time to onboard them and say, this is their first job out of college and walk them through, okay, what is the basics of, say, vulnerability management and walk through all the A, Bs and Cs, it just would take way too much time to do. So a lot of it is context-based. Um, but I've been in larger organizations that have been very tight from a cybersecurity perspective, but I've also been in organizations that have been very loose from a cybersecurity perspective. So it all just depends. It all, there's a lot of changes that go on when you're looking at the larger ones. And for me, import, it's important to onboard. When you're looking at very tight, thin organizations, when you talk about onboarding, um, it's a little more challenging because uh, you've got so little time to get so much done. And so that creates, you need, you need higher quality candidates. It actually costs companies more in the long run. But if you can get the appropriate alignment and say, look, I need to, we need to mentor somebody who can't really afford it. Let's take the time to build them up over a period of time, educate them on the right things to do. Um, that can be a huge help. But again, it just depends on the type of people, the type of culture. Because part of what I do when I step into an organization is I read the culture, find out what the issues are, and then try to figure out the people after you understand the environment first. And what are the, really the needs, whether they're compliance-based, risk-based, cultural-based. There's a lot of things that factor into that. Yeah, that's smart, I think, to really take the time to get to know the lay of the land before you start. You know, you kind of have to walk before you can run and really understand the organization before you try to start plugging people into it. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you don't have a deeper understanding of the organization, you could make a mistake and then, you know, then you have to start all over again. And, uh, you know, uh, some some bad hires might be costly for you as well. So makes sense. Um I guess, obviously, we talk a lot about the talent gap on the show. Um, would you say that the talent gap is real in your experience? And if so, what would you say it looks like? So I'm in New York City. The companies I've worked for have always been New York based. And I've worked in, you know, government, whether it be state or federal government contracts and things like that. So it's broad, but also I don't come from a small town. So just kind of put some context in it. There are always people around, I find, if you can pay them. You know, I've had a lot of people I would have loved to have hired over the years, but, you know, we couldn't pay an extra five grand or something like for a small company, you know, they care about small little details like that. Like, no, they're a good fit. They're able to do the work. Um, so that ends up being a little bit of a challenge there. Um, it all depends on what you're going for. Sometimes if you're looking at specialized skill sets, that can be very specific. For example, if you have a specific tool and you need to get off the ground very quickly, that can be a little bit more of a challenge. And I've tried, I've done those hires, but then you have to be a little bit more flexible. Can you hire outside of the city? Can you hire elsewhere and, and take a look at the larger context? So I'd say it depends a little bit, but it also depends on the type of position you're going for. If you're going for a more senior level position, there are a lot of those around, but you, you need to expect to pay for those positions. If you're looking at a more generic role, like if you've already got an established program and you can get somebody a little more junior, like in a larger organization, I'd say there are quite a few people out there that are really eager to work. Um, it's been my experience. And there's a lot of people who want to transfer into security. So there's a lot of excited people uh, that are going into that role. Um, but definitely it can be a bit of a challenge because 
are they going to be sufficient for your organization? And um, one of the things that I always look for when I'm looking at a position, do I need a pair of hands or do we need a head or some kind of combination between the two? Do I need somebody to really lead it and figure out what they're going to do? Or do I need somebody to do a lot of punching of buttons and figuring things out? And usually most of the cybersecurity jobs, it's sort of a combination of both. But trying to get somebody very junior can be very disastrous when the need is much higher than that. So again, that boils down to the cultural need. What is the need from an IT organization perspective or from a governance perspective? All of these things have to be factored in. Yeah, and I would imagine it gets more difficult to hire. There's more of a quote unquote talent gap for the more highly specialized positions. Like you said, the more senior roles, the ones that, you know, these folks are automatically because of supply and demand making more money. Uh, are there certain, I guess, sub disciplines of security or skill sets that you would say are kind of the most, I don't know, either in demand or we're lacking people in those areas? Um, it sort of depends because every organization is different. And so the composition of a security program is always different. But I would say, like, if you're being very specific in a skill set, like a lot of skills are very transferable. Like I mentioned vulnerability management a couple of minutes ago. Um, that's something where I think the skills are very transferable. If you're going to use product X versus Y versus Z, it shouldn't matter too much. Um, but when you get into, say, an identity solution, um, if you're trying to figure out how to manage that, set it up and work with things, that could be a lot more challenging to find somebody who is really good at a specific solution in, in that particular case. And that's where sometimes, you know what, maybe not hiring somebody internal, but just getting an external person to come in and do the job or an external company who's got expertise in that area sometimes makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. And obviously, sometimes when you have that specialized role, like you mentioned before, you're going to come up against salary as a blocker. Uh, are there any particular other challenges that you've encountered over the years in hiring when it comes to hiring somebody that specific that fits, you know, very niche need within your team? You've got to be flexible and open minded. I mean, trying to find somebody even in a place as big as New York City, and it's got a lot of talented people. That's where the the challenges come in. Can you afford to pay them as much as you need to? Or can you train somebody into that role? And that's where there's always a little bit of a balance. So it's, it's can you afford them? And can you get somebody who's uh, maybe not an A player, let's get a B player, but how important is it to the organization? So you, that, that changes the argument that you're going to make upwards. Um, but those are the roadblocks, the primary roadblocks that I've run into. In some cases, if you don't have anybody, uh, either, as I said, outsource or look at training somebody into that role who's got experience in something adjacent to the technology, you know, depending on the technology. Like, for example, if you get into the GRC space, there are a lot of products out there in the market today, and that is a vastly and quickly changing market. And the reality is large language models and artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, things like that are changing the whole landscape. So things that used to take a long time to do are now being automated and set up in a very different way. So I think things are going to become a little bit easier from uh, at least a GRC perspective than they are from others when I look at the technology as it's starting to grow today. So I think you have to be very open to the the types of tools and, and take a look at it. And what's really going to be the most efficient? You know, sometimes you don't want somebody like, no, there's one way to do it and one product. I've seen people like that, that like you have to use one product. And that can definitely create a lot of challenges, especially um, if they, they buy into the sales side of the house. I mean, that's, that's another thing too. And you're dealing with upper management. Sometimes they know your job better than you do. So they're going to have very specific opinions, but that's getting into not so much the hiring, but how do you deal with the back end channels when you're starting to uh, look for the right people? Yeah, and I would imagine time to hire at some point factors into that calculus as well when you're looking at hiring a specialized skill set or it's either that or, like you said, kind of train somebody and figure out what time horizon you're looking at. If you can get somebody trained in a month, but it's going to take you, you know, three months to hire somebody with that specialized skill set, what's, you know, what's the better play, especially when you factor in salary? You know, uh, if you hire somebody that's five out of 10 on the skills, they're probably on average going to be cheaper than the person that's a 10 out of 10. So, um, yeah, that's 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 a great example. Uh, you know, saying that you you would be more open minded and not quite as specific, figuring out different areas that you can flex. Uh, so, location is a great one. I know, especially in New York, it's a very difficult uh, geography uh, to to recruit for. Um, there's you know, there's a lot of people in the city, but it's also um, it's also hyper competitive. Uh, what are your thoughts on I guess the the hybrid remote 
RTO stuff going on. Like I, I'm starting to hear a lot of companies are pushing more towards RTO. Uh, is that something that you've kind of encountered? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've worked at organizations that are like, nope, just stay home, especially since the pandemic. And I've also been ones that have pushed towards return to office, as you were pointing out. Um, I really do believe in a blending of things because I think one of the things we don't have is a lot of flexibility in a lot of different positions that are out there. They want you to be there 100% of the time, you know, et cetera. That can create a lot of internal challenges. And so you have to take a look at what generations, the younger generations tend to like working from home a little bit more, but I also think there's something to be said about face-to-face -face communication and contact. It's something that's very important to me. Um, I find that the tenor of conversations is very different when you're talking to somebody face to face. You treat it with a little more gravity. Um, you treat it more serious. And, and when you're looking at different types of cultures, and I have dealt with, you know, fantastic cultures and less than fantastic cultures, you know, it's good to really have that face to face communication. So I like the hybrid model is the best way to work, you know, and it also depends on the job function too. Um, in the cybersecurity space, a lot of times stuff can be done remotely. But again, when you're talking face to face, with somebody, it's going to change the tenor of that conversation. You know, I'm of the age where like we didn't have all the stuff. We had, you know, instant messenger was a new thing, like, ooh, instant messenger. Um, but you communicate differently when you're looking at a non-personal channel. And that's something is a, a being somebody who's of the Gen X generation, um, you know, that really shocked us. Like, whoa, that, that communication really is different because we're used to face to face. We'd pick up the phone and have a conversation with somebody occasionally, but not all the time. You go meet for coffee or for dinner or, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, when you're dealing with the instant communication, that communication level goes down and down and down, depending on the organization, depending on a lot of different factors. So I find that you have to change your whole mode and, and way of thinking with things. So do you, do you want to be very strong in it? And sometimes it's good to start off, you know, very strong with being in the office and getting to know people and the meeting and greeting with people. Um, you know, in the C-level executive space, I think that's incredibly important to meet somebody face-to-face, uh, -face, get to know them, understand their mannerisms, what are they really interested in, and start to see what the culture is and try to see if you can start to change that culture. You know, and once that culture starts to stabilize a little bit, we find like a happy medium for that organization, then you can kind of back off on being into the office all the time. But I think initially, it's really important just to help establish that culture. Yeah, I mean, you're almost kind of setting a baseline for communication and uh, relationships and things, which I you know totally see the value in. And you're totally right about the tenor of conversation. Uh, I'm guilty of this myself. I think it's way easier to send a snippy email than it is to be snippy, uh, you know, face to face with somebody. It's just the it's just a, a artifact, I guess, of how humans communicate. You know, we we didn't evolve to be uh, purely online beings, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're a social species. Uh, so there's certainly value in that. And I've been personally trying to get out there and, and do more networking uh, face to face, because I, I think it is easier to develop those deeper and more long lasting, uh, stronger relationships on, on the in-person front. I think the biggest thing that I see as a recruiter when it comes to the remote thing is that um, people just want flexibility. You kind of hit on that earlier. It's not so much like I have to be 100% remote. It's more I want to have the flexibility to take my kid to the doctor if I need to one day or um, you know, be able to avoid traffic if it's really bad in, in your area. I know like Atlanta, D.C., people would do just about anything to, to avoid commuting during rush hour, uh, as would I having commuted in Tampa at this point. So uh, I think all of those little things certainly add up in, in matter. Um, and obviously, you, you have thought a lot, it sounds like, about culture for the teams that you've managed. Um, how have you found that management of culture? How do you set up an effective culture? And because I believe that that culture definitely feeds into retention as well. And that's one aspect of the talent gap people really don't talk about. It's all about, well, we can't get enough qualified people on board. It's like, great. But once you have them on board, you, you know, you have to keep them. So uh, I guess back to my question, I got a little sidetracked. How do, how do you build an effective uh, team culture? So every organization is different. You have to understand the larger culture first, but then you get the team culture based on that. And, you know, and I think a lot of interaction is important. But when I look at things from a principal perspective, it's a, I do like the DEI, the diversity, equity, inclusion, but engagement, support, and equity. 
You know, so when I look at kind of the the management foundations, that's where you have to begin. You know, um, and, and trust is a very big part of that whole engagement process. So understanding the basic principles first, you know, setting the expectations, you know, is incredibly important. If you don't set the expectations and stay on top of that, that's where things can start to derail quickly. You know, I have worked in homogenous organizations and I've worked with heterogeneous organizations. Um, one of the things they say that's important out of the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's got some challenges. I completely admit that. If you're in a small town and you, it's, a, it's a monoculture, you don't have a choice if you're to only can hire people in the small town. It's just not an option. So trying to make things uniform and draconian, say this is the way things must be, that's that's a whole other issue. But um, generally speaking, getting people that are a little bit uncomfortable, and they found this to be true, and I've seen this experientially as well, you get that diversity that's in there. Um, be, having that little bit of discomfort means, oh, I'm going to strive and do a little bit better. I'm going to be a little bit better rather than, oh, let me just kind of back off and not get the right things done at the right time or, or whatever. Um, but when, if you start by respecting somebody, you start by being honest and upfront with them. And you don't have to give too many things up front and too many statements up front. But at least if you're trying to be uh, a level of communication, understand what their issues are, have that conversation with them on a regular basis to kind of stay up to date with it. Um, you know, if there are extremely toxic people on the team, sometimes you do have to let them go. Um, you know, that's nothing that any manager wants to do, um, but it's something that sometimes has to be done in order to uh, best protect organizations today, um, not only from a security standpoint, but to, to create a, a solid culture. So when I approach things, I do like diversity in general, because it does foster a better uh, place. Um, inclusion, include them in the decision-making process. Do they think that there's a better way to do things or not? Sometimes you do have to be, this is what we have to do. Here's a timeline, get it done because there's a project and you have to get things done on in a particular uh, point of time. Other times you can be a little bit more flexible with the approach. And so matching the, the management style to the situation, I think is absolutely critical. Uh, and making sure that you get buy-in from people. You're like You can say something, but people may or may not agree with it or not agree with it and may behave on their own. So it's important to reinforce it or say, hey, we noticed we missed a gap here. Why did we miss that gap? What's the issue? Um, you know, but it's also just learning about the individual personalities uh, behind things. Like today, I was just looking at a, a, one of those you know reports that was out, and it was sort of interesting just to kind of see, okay, how do people work? And so, as I was uh, commenting on one of the guys that I work with, you know, somebody said, "Well, how do you feel about people that are around you who may not say hi to you every time you walk by?" You know, some people like me, I'm not going to care if you don't say hi to me. I'm not going to worry about it. But some people are very sensitive to those kind of things. It can devastate them, you know, over little things like that. And to me, it's small, but to other people, it's the whole world. And so I like to, you know, try to understand a little bit more about people and try to meet them at their level to be respectful to them is one of the mechanisms that I use. So if I know they're a little, if they, if they need that little extra reinforcement, I make sure I have a friendly face, say hello to them, get to know them a little bit more and, and make sure I say hi on a regular basis. So a lot of this stuff is not, you know, here's the one formula. It's got to be followed for everybody everywhere because some people legitimately don't care and that's perfectly fine too. So. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you you take a measured approach to um, you know uh, building trust over time, uh, understanding the people reporting to you, uh, setting expectations up front. Which I would I would say that that really needs to happen starting in the recruiting process and moving all the way through to you know performance reviews. Um, like you said, uh, toxicity can start brewing if if. Uh, expectations are either mismanaged by management or expectations are not met by management um, or if uh, expectations of management are not met by employees uh, there's there's kind of a give and take there uh, and and I think trust is a good foundation for all of those things but yeah another point you brought up was that you really need to kind of understand the individual personalities on your team uh, that I would say you can't say enough about that. Um, I'm thinking of a situation where I worked for a company and as a part of my job, they wanted me to every single day go around the office uh, and say hi to every person and have a conversation, just chit chat. 
And I did not want to do that at <laughs> all. It was completely against my nature. Uh, and so it made me so uncomfortable. And I just, I flat out refused to do it. And that was a big sticking point. And that was, you know, a mark on my performance, uh, which is why I think if you're going to have something like that, it's important to ask, is this really necessary, you know, or is it something that we're doing for whatever reason that may not be a hundred percent necessary? Let's, let's align the, the goals of what we want this person to accomplish and figure out maybe a better path to get there. Um, so, you know, expectation setting, I imagine kind of ties in the goal setting a little bit. Um, how do you set, I guess, attainable, but sufficient stretch goals for your team to make sure that you're making progress, but you're not I guess, stretching people too thin. So I'm really big on, and again, this is something I, I, a topic I very much care about. It's strive for the 40 hours, you know, try not to go beyond that. And there have been study after study, after study, after study that's done this whole topic on how many hours per week should you work towards. It's been looked at in multiple countries. Some countries are trying to go to three days per week or four days per week, depending, you know, and a lot of that gets down to some of the culture, like in, in one country, I won't say which one it is, but they've got um, a very strong culture, nine to five, you get out, you do not look at social media. You know, the United States, like, hey, I'll just check my Facebook or my LinkedIn or whatever the story is. And a lot of people have looking at LinkedIn as part of their job description. I know quite a few people where that's true. Um, but it's it's sussing out what those individual factors are, you know, and trying to make sure that you try to do things. There, things aren't always going to be perfect. And you let people know that ahead of time. And I try to do only requiring to them to work overtime when absolutely necessary, if there's an absolute requirement for it. Because I think at a certain point when you're working too many hours, unless you're just management is totally clueless and they don't know what's going on, which I've seen before too, um, 40 hours is very optimal. You know, you start going beyond that. Um, you get less and less effective, in which case, why are you working so many hours? Now, that's tough in many situations. And many uh, CISOs are in a situation where they're having to do that because the demands are very high and the situation is changing, especially when it comes to the legal side of the house um, that we've been seeing recently. Um, so there's a lot of changes um, going on. But what I try to do is just try to balance out and make sure that they're not working too many hours, check in on them, like how many hours you're working. If I see somebody working more hours, ask them, hey, are you okay? What's going on? And and try to instill that sense of reasonableness. Now, it depends on the culture, because I've worked in cultures like, no, you are expected to work at least 60 hours a week. You know, you try to catch those kind of red flags when you're hiring. And I made the mistake jumping into a position once where that was the expectation, minimum 60 hours. Um, I don't think that it's very productive. It makes people unhappy in terms of being able to stay there for a long period of time. Everybody can work. And there's stints where you've got to work 80, 90 hours a week. And then I get that. I've been there myself. I have, you know, spent months doing that at certain points, you know. Sometimes, you know, going through the crucible is an important part of that and showing that you're willing to stand up and do the right thing when necessary, I think is absolutely critical. But in general, strive to stay away from that and try to create that balance by communicating with the team, making sure that HR is on board with it, making sure that your manager is on board and some are and some aren't. But it's it's all about setting the appropriate expectation and creating the right uh, communication and understanding, you know, what's the flight risk? You know, that's something to look at within organizations is the flight risk for organizations. Why is an individual person considered a flight risk? Is that going to be an issue? Is that not going to be an issue? How can you change that if you perceive a flight risk? Yeah. And hours worked, I would imagine, especially over the long term, is a, is a huge factor in uh, attrition. And um, yeah, I mean, at least for myself, uh, being mandated to work a certain number of hours without any real justification for doing so, that was the problem. It was never that I had a problem working long hours, you know, if there's a good reason to do so. And I think most people are that way. Um, yeah. I kind of see it as like the, the difference between long-term stress and acute stress. You know, you're okay with really hard work in short bursts, but if it's really hard work, long hours over long periods of time, uh, like you said, you're just not going to get the best out of people that way. And, and then people start making mistakes and errors and uh, the productivity per hour goes down. So you may be getting the same work output of somebody working 60 hours a week versus 40 hours a week, just because they're not as effective in those hours because they're working so many hours. So yeah, yeah it's, yeah, I think a constant dance between 
efficacy and efficiency uh, and you want to keep a close eye on that uh, and, and the closer you can stay to your employees to understand if somebody is starting to burn out or uh, if they're complaining to their coworkers, hey this is unsustainable what are we doing here um, you know you you really have to have um, your arms around that I, I think is yeah. a is a higher up um, so awesome what about uh, your relationship with uh, recruiting and and HR folks over the years, uh, obviously there's a lot of talk on LinkedIn about how job descriptions can get cobbled together and look rough, uh, or how, you know, sometimes HR recruiters don't really know what they're looking for when it comes to security folks. How have you, how have you found those relationships in, in your time hiring over the years? So one of the things that I've always done, create a realistic job description, you know, understand what are the goals of the person? What is your plan? How are they going to fit into it? And what do you really need given the context? Make sure that you're communicating that very clearly. Like if, for example, your company has like a one to five rating for the level of person they are, let's say a security analyst, you know, the expectations are vastly different between a level one and a level five. Level five, you're probably starting to get ready for a director level position or possibly some other level position above an analyst, maybe a management position. Um, I, I think, you know, just understanding that. And I think a lot of people don't understand things like CISO job descriptions. I find uh, very interesting over the years, too, because a lot of times I don't think they understand what a CISO chief information security officer actually is. And so they have these expectations that to me are out to lunch. You find them when you walk into job descriptions, you walk into jobs. But um, that's a whole nother angle. Uh, for that side of things, because the CISO really needs to be talking about and building the strategy up at the, at the senior corporate level for most organizations. If you're talking about a five person organization, that's different. Um, you know, and every organization is going to be different. But I've seen CISO positions that are like, oh, you're the firewall admin, get to it. You can't be an effective CISO if you're a firewall admin. But I've seen those positions. I've been recruited for it and said, no, thank you. Um, but for me, when you talk, because you brought up quite a few different points there, you talk about uh, human resources, um, making sure that they are on board. Now, sometimes, though, when you get higher ups, I've seen people on the IT side of the house say, no, no, you can throw this in there and this in there, and they throw the whole kitchen sink in there. Well, now you're looking at somebody who is doing a lot more work and you need, a, you need to pay them more and they need a lot more experience in order to take on those roles or at least have the capacity to perform working on those types of goals. So um, I think that creates a lot of challenges, you know, sometimes because everybody's reporting into somebody and you've got to make sure that you write the right type of description for the right role. And that to me is incredibly important. Now, I've been in situations where I've had to hire because higher ups wanted to do things in a different way. But what's interesting, because I work with a lot of cybersecurity recruiting firms as well, they oftentimes don't have a clue what they're doing or they, they even throw their hands up in the air like, this person doesn't exist. You're looking for a unicorn. Like, I got to do the best job I can. I'm, I've, I've made the arguments. I've made the discussions. The, the approvals are out there. And I'm kind of like, well, let's just go see what we can do. And then I'll go back based on the data that you provide me and let senior management know what's going on. So sometimes that is not on, the hum on human resources at all. When I have worked with internal human resources, you know, it depends on the position. So if they're looking for like a level one position, they usually can do OK. OK, they got a graduate degree or they've got some sort of certification or something. OK, you know, my expectations are not massively high on a level one position. But if you're talking about a level three or four, that's where, you know, trying to use that judgment is a little more difficult. In some cases, they don't have a clue. Sometimes they're stretched too thin. Uh, sometimes they don't understand IT, you know, if they're in that hiring position. I've been stuck in that position before, too. And it's just easier to use an outside recruiting firm to go find that or use something like LinkedIn to go find those uh, types of positions. So the, the answers are not, hey, here's the one way to do it. I've you know, worked in a lot of different organizations, so I have completely different opinions depending on the organization. But again, it boils down to listening and understanding and then responding to the environment in an appropriate way, given the limitations of your position. Yeah, I think a lot of companies, they would like to perhaps use a specialist recruiter like me to, to help them find security people. But maybe, like you said, they're a 20 person company and they don't even have an internal recruiter, much less, a, you know, a specialist external recruiter or the budget to work with one. Uh, how does a company of that size hire their first security person? You know, would, wh whose responsibility would you say it, it falls? Who has the responsibility to find that first security hire in a smaller organization? And 
how can you, if you do have say an HR generalist that needs to go find that person, how do you help educate that person as to, you know, what you need? So if you're talking about your first person, and I've been in that role myself, um, where you know, on both sides of it, where I've been hired, brought into it, you know, the job description is not perfect, but you know what, you don't, you, if you're waiting for perfection, you'll never get a job. You know, that just doesn't exist. If you're waiting for a perfect culture, it doesn't exist, you know? So first off, you've got to, you know, be a little bit flexible on some of this stuff. Um, but what I would do is go talk to other people. Um, you know, what's actually required. Take a look at some of the stuff that's out there on the internet. Take a look at the jobs that are descriptions as, they're, as they are written, but go talk to somebody, go find out what is a good CISO. What are they striving to do? You know, to me, when you get into larger organizations, you know, the CISO might even hire a marketing person. I've heard of multiple CISOs that their first hire was marketing. How do we market to this large organization? You know, that is not appropriate in a 20 person organization. So in, in those cases, um, I've not had to hire a CISO, but I've had to hire first hi other types of first hires um, for different types of positions. A lot of it is just like, what what does the business need, and what can you get away with? And sometimes, you know, when you talk to senior management, they they don't understand this stuff. You're talking Greek to them. You talk about uh, CASB or SASE, you know, things like that. What? It, it just doesn't make any sense to them. You know, they don't understand it. And a lot of times it's about these higher order skills that are so important. You know, um, you know, for example, one of the concepts that I'm, I'm a big fan of is something called assurance. And I've been used, I was told at a place once, hey, we have all these people here, assurance, and all they were was engineers. So if you're doing assurance, how are you validating that you had you had the same person doing the validation as putting things in place. And they're just like, ah, oh, it's okay. It's okay. Just let it go. Don't worry about it. You know, cause nobody likes to be reviewed, but those are the kind of things that get CISOs fired in some cases, because if they aren't, if they don't know what's going on, you have to take a look at the visibility within an organization to say, Hey, where are the different challenges uh, that we have from a cybersecurity perspective? And do we have the appropriate visibility in order to make those changes? So when you're hiring, you have to consider all of those different things and what are you able to do? Now, in some organizations, you're stuck and they just want to do, hey, get it implemented. Maturity, who cares? You know, policies and procedures, we know what's going on. So you have to read that culture and say, what kind of person do you need? In some cases, you need a transformation person, somebody to go in there and say, well, here's some of the reasons why we need strong policies and procedures. Here's what's happened in the past. And so learning that history and educating people on the A, Bs and Cs is oftentimes more important than having this particular technical skill set. So again, it's about reading the culture, about reading the environment, and do the best job you can under the context and under the circumstances. And just recognize sometimes you're in a tough place. Yeah. Well, and, and you bring up a good point too about how sometimes soft skills can actually be the most important thing, even if it's, you know, early on in a company's hiring for, you know, uh, say a security department. Uh, and, and to touch on something you had said earlier, sometimes you just you need the the unicorn to fill that hole on your team. You have you know X, Y, and Z uh, amount of skills, and nobody else on your team has it. In which case, you have to either you know train the people that are currently on your team to fill in some of these gaps, and or go out there and and find that person. Um, how do you determine if that person? exists in the market or not like how do you know that you're being reasonable and asking for that unicorn and and understanding what the size of the talent pool actually looks like for that unique person that you need to find so some of it i just know i've been in the industry long enough i have worked with enough people i have developed it so i mean to me i've got this intuition about this kind of thing you know if they've been 20 years in the networking world and i need a dba bad fit, you know? Um, but some of it, you go back and talk to the, to the recruiters, you know, like, as I said, I've worked with cybersecurity recruiters. They'll come back and tell me doesn't exist. And I know it ahead of time, but then if I go back and say, look, the people who do this 24, seven, 365 saying, look, this is a unicorn. What do you want me to do? Um, you know, you know, it's possible to find somebody, but this could take six, six months, a year. Are you okay with something like that? Can we go back and change what we need to get done? And uh, sometimes the answer for that is yes, and sometimes no. And so you make do under the circumstances. But I think that's one of the big challenges because a lot of people think, oh, you know, security, you know, everything in security. No, but the same thing happens over in the IT space too. Oh, you can fix antivirus. You should know everything. And like, no, 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 no. Th these are all respected 
professional skill. So you talk about talk about a developer versus the networking person versus the DBA versus the Windows administrator versus a Linux administrator. Somebody might have junior skills at a lot of these different things, but if you need an expert to run on it, you have to understand the environment that you're in. And you it's oftentimes not. And I've watched people do that. I actually warned somebody. They had me because I was a, um, a chief information security officer at the time, and they were just wanted me to listen to their uh, person. And they had somebody who had barely touched a firewall. And I said, look, we need somebody more than just barely touched a firewall to be in here because they need to run the firewalls. I, I think you're going to need a better person. In this case, it wasn't up to me. They made a choice that I thought the person was not the greatest person for. But you know, you win some, you lose some. You know, you do the best job you can, you help people, but you can lead a horse to water, but not necessarily uh, make them drink. Yeah. And certainly as an external recruiter, I've noticed that over the years too. I could, you know, try and set expectations going back to that point from earlier uh, about what exists on the market. Uh, but like you said, you can lead a horse to water. You, you can't always convince somebody that this, that this person doesn't exist, or maybe there's only two of these folks. So, um, say you're in, in that scenario and you, you talk to the recruiter and they inform you, okay, there's only five of these people in the entire U S the chances of us getting one of these people is, is relatively low, just based on, you know, uh, talent pool size. W what, what requirements can we flex on? If any, how do you determine what makes the cut and what doesn't? Um, first, you try to see, well, what's the pay for that unicorn uh, you, for those five people? I mean, you and I both know it's going to be pretty high, typically speaking. Um, I, I've seen people that are getting paid $350 an hour or more uh, just for some of those very senior positions if they're really, really good at what they're doing. You know, and these are usually sought after by the big banks. You know, is this going to be worthwhile? So if I get the information from you and I could say, well, what if we break the skills up into two different areas and here's the different areas? What would this look like? And, and try to get all the facts. So part of what I do is, is if I go back to, if I need to go back to senior management, a lot of times I know I'm going to need to anyway. I go talk to recruiters, get all the information. Then I go back to senior management and say, look, here's the story. This is what they're telling me. And but then, of course, you don't always take the recruiter's word for it. You know, do a Google search, look on Indeed, take a look at some of these other things and try to find out, is this really what's needed? Or, you know, what's what's the business need for it? You know, I've been in organizations where that $350 an hour person, you kind of have to have them anyway. So you're going to bring them in and, and it's going to be perfectly fine. And that's perfectly acceptable. I've seen it where those people get paid more than the chief information security officer in some cases. Um, and that's something that's just, it's, it's an ugly part of things, but it's sort of the reality of sometimes what you have to do to get the right talent, to build the right programs, to be able to work with other companies out there. And sometimes that can bring in a lot of business. So there's value in doing that, but you have to see how much value is it going to bring in versus not bring in. And there's an estimation game that's going on, but you go back and you talk to them saying, look, here's the reality. You know, we should think about hiring somebody. Yes, it's going to take us twice as long or maybe five times as long to go build the same thing. But if we get, say, a level two person rather than this level five person you were looking for, maybe we can do it, but it's going to take two years rather than six months to build. You know, is that something that's acceptable? So it's all about creating that alignment with senior management, creating the alignment with other people and making sure that you're making sense. You know, the scenario I just posed could be completely ridiculous for a lot of organizations. I'd probably say 99% of organizations are going to say the scenario I posed is ridiculous, but there are some contexts where that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and speaking of sort of business cases and, and context, um, one of the things, one of the business cases that I think a lot of hiring managers struggle to make in this day and age is developing that talent pipeline to bring on at least one person, but preferably a whole crop of people, you know, say per semester, if it's a campus recruiting program or, you know, finding a way to, to train and mentor people to not only help the industry as a whole, but also in the long term help the company. I mean, really, that's the goal if, you know, for whatever, whatever company you're working for. Uh, I think often we default as you know, hiring experts to, uh, looking at the short term view because, um, you know, money drives everything and we, we have to make our numbers and on a quarterly basis, the numbers have to look good. How do you build the business case? And uh, you kind of alluded to the fact that this is obviously going to be dependent on the size of the organization, it's set up budget, you know, timeline, all that good stuff. But could you build a business case for hiring, um, or building a pipeline of entry level folks or at least juniors? Yes, 
but I'm going to put a condition on that as well. So um, I, I do think that's that's easy, easily doable, and I think in many cases it can be done. But you have to have enough heads in place to bring in the hands to start doing the work. And the reality is, is you start to mature your organization. You know, the head is going to help; they're going to direct things, and then you get the hands doing things. But you don't just give them one thing to do and they repeat that thing over and over and over again until the end of time. They're going to get bored, or at least a lot of people. I know some people would love doing the same job over and over again, but it, it, you get them on something new. Okay, great. You did a fantastic job here. Let's move you to B and let's get you in a C. Let's get a little bit of cross training going. <clears throat> I like to do that as well because just in case somebody needs to go out on vacation or whatever the story is, you know, and actually this is from federal government days, you needed to do that. You had somebody else take over your responsibilities. So you could catch fraud. So if somebody were taking over my responsibilities and I'm committing fraud, they would see that as part of the process and go, oh, we found a problem here. Um, it comes even the banking industry will use uh, things like that. But to me, that cross training is very important because you know what? Everybody's got a different perspective on things. This goes back to the diversity discussion, because if I've got an opinion, well, somebody else is going to have an opinion, too. And it's all about how do you not be perfect at the outset, but how do we create the best of all possible worlds? Um, but creating that business case, a lot of times it deals with the maturity. So as you start to grow, do you want to get your was level one person? Now they're a level three person to sit there doing the same activity over and over and over again for eons. You're going to lose them. So if you get them in a higher level position, give them more responsibility, more authority, and then you bring in somebody underneath that to start doing those level one tasks, it starts to create a better pipeline. Now, in some cases, like if you're talking about a SOC analyst, a security operations center analyst, especially for a large organization who does this for other companies, that's par for the course. You need to have the people in there doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's situations like that that I would start to create that particular business case. Um, you know, especially if there's a need. Hey, we've got a gap here. I want this person to do this. It's more than a 40 hour job. Here's what we're doing. We're building something new. Let's try to get somebody in there to help support that. So a lot of times what I do when I, if I, especially when I just jump into an organization and it already has a security program in place, what are all the different functions that are going on? What's the technology? What do we, is it supported properly? Are we handling it properly? Do we have appropriate staff? Um, are there problems? What are the problems with it? And you start to document everything. And then you say, great. Well, how important is this tool? Like I've walked into organizations said, you know what? We don't need this tool. It's not being used. There's a ton of other problems. We've got some other issues we need to build first. I will get rid of the tool. Um, so I try to be very reasonable in my approach um, and say, what's the value of it from a business standpoint, even from the cybersecurity tools that are out there. Um, but where appropriate, you build the business case and start to build the people uh, to go along with that. Yeah. And I would imagine once you kind of get a, come into a new role and get the lay of the land and figure out what's going on, figure out where your efficiencies are, document everything and you know, figure out what each, uh, what each member of the team is doing and document their responsibilities, do kind of a skills inventory for, for each individual. Yeah. Uh, at that point, you start identifying possibly some gaps or some overlaps or some places where, you know, you could, maybe move some of the responsibilities from your more senior people down to somebody more entry level, take some things off of their plate. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've, you've opened up uh, an entry level role or, you know, at least something junior to help out your more senior people. Uh, and there's, there's so much that feeds into retention. And I think that's one of those things, like you mentioned, having people doing the same thing always without any, opportunity for training or advancement or feeling like they can kind of move around or learn more things. You know, if you're, if you're hiring really highly motivated, intelligent people, they want to challenge and they do enjoy that cross training that you mentioned. Uh, even if it's just shadowing somebody on a different uh, security team, you know, if they're uh, yeah. a SOC analyst and you have some forensics in house as well, have them work with the forensics team, see if that's something that they enjoy or, you know, maybe can move into eventually at some point. So if you're constantly doing all this cross training and succession planning, one, it's going to be easier if you do have somebody leave to have redundant skill sets, basically, like you mentioned, if you're doing cross training, you don't have just one person with that skill set, you can kind of, you have more flexibility, I think, to, you know, move people around. Yeah. Um, what, what have you, you know, we kind of hit on the, um, the job description thing earlier, but uh, what are your thoughts on certifications and, and education and experience uh, and their relationship to job descriptions? Do you weight any of those most heavily? 
Um, it depends on the position. You know, it depends on, you know, if I'm looking for a cultural fit, you don't get a cultural fit by getting a Cisco certification, you know? Um, so it depends on what you're striving to get and what, what the particular job is. Um, you do evaluate some of these other things, but when you're talking about how much do you weight it, you know, it depends. Like if they've got a CISSP and they're a level one, whoa. You typically you don't find that, but sometimes that shows a, a very strong interest in a position and something you might consider uh, that particular person when bringing them on board. Um, you know, so you can factor those things in, but I really like to sit down and talk to people and find out, you know, what are their areas of expertise? What have they been doing? What's the, what's their manager think about it? Um, there's a lot of different factors that play into uh, stuff like that uh, when you're making those decisions. You know, I do think that uh, formal education is a help, especially if you're getting a level one person, formal education, you're there. You know, you've, you've, you've done a good job. At least you're, I, I'm not expecting you to be an expert, but at least you've heard of the concepts that are foundational. You understand basically compliance. Maybe you've never done it before, but there is some basic types of compliance that that person can start to jump into because there's so much, so much good that can come out of somebody who is very eager to learn and recognizes that they know that they don't know. Um, you know, they would consider things like the Dunning Kruger effect and trying to see where are they at on the knowledge curve. You know, when if sometimes fresh out of school, they think they know everything, but then the reality is, and they realize they know nothing. And then when you slowly get back up there, you, you feel like, okay, you got some knowledge when you start to get a little bit older and you've been in the industry for a few years, but you don't have the extreme arrogance you do when you first jump out uh, of a, uh, um, into, into the world. So um, I do think that you you factor in a little bit of that recognition of how long they've been in the industry, what have they been doing, what have they spent their time on, um, what are some of the skill sets they've had, what have they built over time, what have their leadership skills, get a cultural fit for them to understand what are their strengths and weaknesses, you know, how is this going to best fit in the team. And, and certs are part of that. Education is part of that. I don't throw that aside. In some cases, though, it's very important. You know, if you're looking at a uh, sales engineer, you know, a lot of times companies love those because, oh, well, I've got somebody who's certified in that. Oh, you know, people take that with a little different uh, gravity than they would just like, yeah, I picked up a firewall and did something. So to me, a certification shows an additional uh, a level of knowledge at a certain point in time. So I do appreciate it for what it is, and I respect it because it does show that somebody's at least interested, at least if they have like a security plus certification. Great. It shows that they're interested. I'm not going to bring them in and say, we're going to make you a level five right away, but I don't think anybody reasonably would do so. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you is that context really is king, uh, understanding the, the total picture of somebody's career and how those certifications or that education factors in to the overall story, the overall picture of this person and, and treating each person like an individual. Um, you know, as, yeah. as a recruiter, I spend a lot of time trying to do that and really understanding people's motivators because I think that's the biggest driver of long-term career matches is what gets somebody out of bed in the morning, why they consider that new job. Uh, you know, uh, it, it has to be a match on motivators or it's not going to be a match for the long term more than, you know, a, a few months. Um, but yeah, certifications, education, they're, they're all just a piece of the overall person. And to go back to your point from earlier, being flexible and, and understanding that people are more than just, you know, one or two things on their resume. If you can really get a sense for what motivates somebody and their attitude, that could weigh more heavily than, you know, something that's, that's on their resume. Um, but you yeah. don't really get to that point unless you actually talk to somebody. So, um, how do you, I guess, find time on your schedule when you're hiring and, um, you know, you, you have a dozen people to interview, say, uh, how do you make that a priority? Well, first thing I do, I like to let the recruiters filter out some of the noise, get their opinion on it. Then I will take a look at it and say, okay, here are the top candidates I think that are going to be interesting. Um, I try to narrow it down to like four or five maximum, if possible, um, You know, depending on those number of uh, interviews that have to go on. So I do appreciate it when HR does an interview of somebody ahead of time. So at least they've gotten rid of the basic wheat from the chaff. I'm going to make the second cut based on that. And to be frank, it's going to be imperfect at times. You could get somebody who's terrible at resume writing, but they're absolutely perfect at everything else. Usually that's a little bit unlikely, but you kind of read between the lines for some of the stuff and try to do the best job that you can to say, hey, is this person going to be a fit, both technically 
and culturally. And I think that's really what's important. And it's going to be imperfect, but you do the best job you can under the circumstances and uh, usually uh, hope for the best. Yeah, for sure. And it, I always say kind of recruiting seems to be half art, half science. You know, there's I've developed my recruiting methodology over the last nine years and it's very finely tuned. But at the same time, there's still room for judgment calls in the process. Uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with humans in hiring. It's not a perfect science every time. And you can't always, um, I guess, justify 100 percent maybe of why somebody's a fit. Uh, you can get maybe 90, 99% there, but rarely can you make a hundred percent certain call based on, you know, uh, on paper fits. How do you steer clear of bias though, when you're, when you're making those judgment calls and you have to evaluate, for instance, somebody's culture fit. I think that's, that's a challenging thing. People have a hard time qualifying or quantifying because it is, it's not very tangible. It's, you know, it's something that you just kind of know it when you see it. How do you evaluate that culture fit piece? So I usually have like layers and it depends on the type of position, but you know, you first do a basic conversation, but it's just about asking questions. You know, what would you do in this context? And the answers you sometimes you get back are, are very interesting. So, you know, what would you do if you, if you knew that you were right, you did a firewall access control list review and you found an ACL that you knew was dead wrong. And somebody's telling you, no, 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 that's perfectly okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And they're opening, opening up to say North Korea, you know, uh, some, sometimes they're usually not that black and white, but sometimes you end up with people who are very obstinate, who are going to say, nope, this is the way to do that. And I've run into that in all types of IT organizations. So you, you just have to sit down and work with them and have a discussion with them. Sometimes you have to bring in their managers and think, but in the interview process, you know, you try to catch it with some, just some basic questions. You know, how do you handle this? Uh, what do you do if this happens or what do you do in this particular case? But hearing their responses gives you so much about that. And, and a lot of the questions are based on the organization itself. What is the current need? Do we have to get the uh, IT stuff done? Is it very IT oriented? We're going to focus on getting these things done or there's some other things. So um, it's never going to be 100% perfect, but you just do the best job you can doing interviews and getting the more senior the position, the more people that should interview that person to determine if they're a good cultural fit or not, because they're going to see things that aren't, um, that others may not. So I think that it's good to come to a consensus on those larger in for those larger organizations to make sure that you get somebody who's going to be a good fit for the organization. Yeah. And I think often the best practice is, is having a variety of seniority levels interviewing that person. Uh, you know, yeah. a manager is going to view somebody differently than a director will than a, you know, senior individual contributor will. And often you'll get little, um, tidbits of somebody's personality more so from their direct peers in the interview process than you would for somebody that's, you know, going to be their boss. Uh, so having that, that cross-functional sort of, uh, interview, I think is, is important in getting to know somebody for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're, we're coming up on time here, Matthew. So, uh, just one last question for you. Is there anything that we're not talking about in the industry, but we should be, uh, especially as it relates to hiring? <sighs> A lot of this just boils down to like the American style of working, you know, and I think that's really where we need to sit down and really look at ourselves. I think there's a, you know, we've got that it's, and I think it's a lot of people attribute it to, if you go back in time from our sociology classes from, from college or high school, they say it's the Puritan ethic, you know, but I think that it's actually taken on a life of its own. It's very different. And I think that that's where we need to, you know, rechallenge some of our assumptions. I'm a little bit more vocal about it because I study it. I work with it. And, and my goal is to be as valuable as possible to people that are around me, people that I'm serving, uh, people that I'm working with. And, um, you know, when you're working 90 hours a week, you're not as valuable as you could be. You know? Yeah, for so. sure. And, and there's no quantifying, I don't think the, the amount of attrition and all the negative effects that you accrue with that kind of workload. For sure. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a great point. Well, Matthew, if, if people want to reach out to you or keep up with the work that you do, what's the best way to do so? Um, LinkedIn is a great place. It's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, if people want to reach out to me uh, for my business, um, it's Matthew, two T's, Matthew.Webster at Cyvergence.biz. Uh, 
Um, feel free to look for me there. Um, I've got some YouTube videos that are out. You kind of see some of the background. I'm just getting started with those. There's so much more I have to do, but at least I'm getting some of the basics in place. So definitely feel free to reach out to me. I'm open to a conversation. If you have questions from a cybersecurity pr perspective, that would be open. I have been accused of being a walking CISSP book on more than one occasion from several different people. So uh, happy to help you out however I can. Excellent. Well, thanks for your time, Matthew, and thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. Hello everyone, and thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Talent Gap Fireside Chat. Don't forget to follow our page on LinkedIn and like and subscribe on Spotify and YouTube. Hit that notification bell to be notified when we drop a new episode. New episodes air every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern.